Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to the New Books Network. I'm your host, John Emmerich. With me today are Catherine Newman and Elizabeth Jacobs, co-authors of Moving the Needle, What Tight Labor Markets Do for the Poor. Welcome, Catherine and Elizabeth. Good morning. Good morning. I I appreciate you all introducing yourselves a little bit about your backgrounds and how this book came about. Catherine, do you want to start? Sure. So I'm a sociologist and I have had very longstanding interests in the labor market and the way in which especially poor people move up or down as the as fortunes allow in the labor market, which is a major institution for structuring all of our lives. Um, This book came about in part because we are experiencing a 53 year low in unemployment. And the question is, does that matter for poor people? There's surprisingly little writing about this topic, but uh, I thought it was really important. And Elizabeth and I have worked together off and on for quite a long time. We first met in the program that I helped to found at Harvard University on inequality and social policy. Um, And more than a decade ago, we wrote a book together, um, which was called Who Cares? And it was on the topic of government intervention on behalf of the poor and whether or not the public supports those kinds of, of efforts. Uh, but 10 years later, I circled back to her and said, hey, I've got a new topic here and you're the perfect person to work on uh, with me. And so that's how this team formed. Elizabeth? Um, thanks, Catherine. Um, so I am also a sociologist. Um, and as Catherine said, we, we met way back when in a, f- a program that she founded and that I was one of the relatively early graduates of um, focusing on inequality and social policy um, as a sociologist. Um, I went on from grad school to be one of those academics who flies out of the nest and into D.C. to do um, the kind of D.C. let's make sure that policy has something to do with evidence. Um, And my career has been in that space in economic policy and many of the um, related social policies that Catherine mentioned that we talk about in in the book, um, but I've long focused on economic inequality um, and its impacts on well-being for individuals and families, as well as economic mobility over the course of, of a lifetime. So when Catherine came to me with this idea, it was super exciting. The other thing relevant in my background that's a little bit different um, than many sociologists is that I have spent most of my career around the economists in DC. um, And I'm very well versed, much well versed than I ever thought I would be in the connection between the macro economy and people's lives, um, which I think is a longstanding question and in some ways motivates the inequality um, social policy program that Catherine founded and what drew me to this work. Um, But there are some longstanding themes in terms of both my professional life um, and Catherine's professional life that have come together and made um, this research project a phenomenally interesting one because it pulls on so many different different pieces of both of our longtime interests and, and careers at a spectacularly wacky and interesting time. <laughs> well, I think, I, I, John, if I may, I should please. add that we, we occupy different uh, locations in the institutional world, which is helpful. So I am the provost um, of the University of California, and I have an academic appointment on the Berkeley campus in sociology and public policy. And Elizabeth is in the think tank world. And maybe you could say a word about where you hang out. Sure. I mean, it's interesting actually hearing you introduce yourself with both a kind of academic institutional role and shaping how how institutions work, as well as your research hat as as a sociologist um, and um, with an appointment in the sociology department. I also am a senior fellow at the Urban Institute. So that's kind of the equivalent of my research hat, but I also am the deputy director and co-founded an initiative at Urban called WorkRise, which is a research action network on jobs, workers, and mobility that's specifically focused on kind of creating a shared institutional space for employers, for workers advocates, for practitioners, for policymakers to both see what evidence there is and also identify what the new questions are that we need answered in order to actually really be making evidence-backed change on behalf of low-wage workers. Um, So I also have a kind of institutional entrepreneurial hat trying to make institutions actually do good things um, as well as my wonky research hat that lets me actually continue to ask and answer questions and do things like write books on my nights and weekends with Catherine. (laughs) Well, that's a perfect combination. I I do a lot of economics interviews and uh, I was an economics student, you know, 35 years ago. And it always gets described as the study of the allocation of resources or scarcity. And to me, 
it's it's one of the social sciences, right? It's not uh, we, we've seen the the math take over the field of economics and trying to reduce um, behavior to a, a rational formula when in reality um, it's as I said, economics is one of the social sciences. It's the study of people's reaction to stimuli. So I'm fascinated to have you both here, and um, we will put you on the hot seat. Uh, in a minute on economics, um, uh, unavoidable in this case. So, and you already stole one of my uh, lines, Catherine, which is congrats on coming out with this book during the tightest labor market in almost 60 years. That timing couldn't have been much better. Um, let's get some definitions out of the way. A tight labor market, there's a difference between 5% and 4% or, and 3.5%. Uh, where I believe we are about now. Um, and there's a difference between tight and especially tight, as you uh, say in the book. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, the numbers before we go forward? Sure. I'm going to turn to Elizabeth for most of the numbers because she's our numbers person. But I will say that just to get it straight, we began this project in the fall of 2019, which was when uh, nobody had ever heard of covid uh, you know, by December of that year, it was something bubbling along in Wuhan, but that's about it. Um, so our interest in this was not originally stimulated by the pandemic because no one had ever heard of it, but it was stimulated by recognizing that a, at that time, a 50 year low in unemployment, I mean, practically the lowest ever on record since records have been kept, was an extraordinary opportunity to ask what does happen to the power that workers have to navigate a better deal for themselves, uh, to the ways in which uh, people on the margins can come into the labor market who've been blocked from it. Those are all theoretical possibilities, but it's very rarely been studied. I mean, we found a couple of papers from our former colleague Dick Freeman in the 1980s, but you know, really there was almost nothing and given how important employment is to virtually everything every social scientist of any stripe has ever said about the poor and about poverty as a condition, it's striking that there's been virtually no research on tight labor markets. And you might think that that's because they never happen, but they do happen. And part of the purpose of this book was to identify when do they happen, how tight do they have to be before we start to see those structural changes, who benefits and for how long? And now I'm going to let Elizabeth actually answer your question about the numbers. <laughs> um, thanks, Catherine. So, John, you mentioned, um, you know, we're at 3.5-ish on average nationally right now. Obviously, the numbers are, are different and quite higher for some folks who have been historically disadvantaged for quite some time. Um, that said... 3.5 is, it's astounding. It's, I mean, it's, I think it's a number that we, as a society, that if you'd asked me as a, a committee staffer on the Hill, which is where I, I went after I finished grad school um, uh, to work for, for a Senate committee, if you'd asked me if 3.5 unemployment was even possible, I'm not sure. I mean, I said it's possible, but I'm not sure I would have said that it was like a realistic goal or something to have in mind. But we see that that's fully possible now. Um, and it's it's pretty incredible. And this has had pretty um, amazing and in some ways unsurprising. But as Catherine said, um, we've actually been able to quantify them in ways that I don't think uh, have been done before. So 3.5 is incredible. But in our numbers, in looking at, um, you know, 50 plus years of, of labor market data and trying to understand, you know, how low does unemployment need to go in order to start seeing traction for low wage workers in terms of getting a foot into employment, getting seeing their wages rise, it's somewhere around 4.5%. Um, which, you know, isn't isn't to say that I don't think 3.5 is great, um, but we see real, real differences start to happen in the data around 4.5 percent, between 4 and 4.5 percent. And it needs to stick. Um, that's the other thing is like one or two months of of low unemployment is, you know, I'm not going to complain about that, but that's not a, enough um, to really see differences happen for people's lives. And there's an intuition to that. I mean, it shouldn't be too surprising if you're a human in the world, if things look good for a month and then go south, um, you know, like that, that <laughs> that's not going to give you longer term traction. So we need to see those rates for at least at least a year. And we've seen that we see that now. Um, this is the longest period of sustained low unemployment, even after you take out the COVID blip, um, I actually need to look at how long 
how long it's been since the COVID blip, because in, like this period that we're in now is increasingly like a real era of its own. It's been long enough um, because the COVID recession was so deep and so sharp, but we bounced back so relatively quickly. Um, we've we've had some sustained periods of, of very low unemployment, including where we are now, but also um, in the 90s and the 80s are a little bit more complicated because we had kind of a double dip recession, but we're, there was some some a blip there. But it's really the 90s um, and now where we were have been able to identify that that real traction that's gotten people the opportunity that we talk about in the book. And, and it's interesting. Um, there's a wonderful strategist at a firm called BCA Research up in Canada, Peter Berzin. And you know, there's always this debate in economic circles, or there has been, is the Phillips curve dead, the relationship between unemployment and inflation? He says, no, it's not dead. It's kinked. And that's just what you described. Like you can go 8% unemployment, seven, six, five, and there's no impact on wages really. Uh, and then you hit this spot and all of a sudden it's a, it's a spike. And um, I almost also think that besides numbers, which are important to understand, there are some qualitative developments that you could almost use to define a tight labor market. Well, first is lower unemployment and marginalized groups getting jobs. But you, as you talk about in the book, and we'll get into later, all of a sudden there's they're throwing more things at you than just wages. They're training and benefits and, and a higher quality job than uh, the late shift. Um, and so right now, uh, I don't know if you want to just talk about, it's kind of interesting that one last economics nerd question, the difference between U3 and U6, right? U3 is the headline inflation that we see on CNBC. Um, it exclu- if someone drops out of the labor force and they stop actively looking for a job, they fall out of whether you want to call it the numerator, or the denominator, however you calculate it. And you don't see that. U6 kind of captures that. And then there's this other funky dynamic where U3 rising during a bull market, if you will, in the economy could be a good thing because that means people are coming back into their, they're encouraged to look uh, for a job. Um, first talk about the, um, where you think we are. And as you said, we've already been through this very long period down here. I've said some data, I've seen some data from, in fact, BCA that says once you hit that peak, it can last on average for about 20 months before a recession sorrowfully, uh, but inevitably kicks in. Uh, w- what dynamics, those qualitative forces are you all seeing that's, that might say um, this is still I don't know. You can't really predict maybe without hindsight. We're in the fourth or fifth inning uh, because employers are still uh, looking to add value from their company for the employer. They've said it's been very hard to retain employees. Right. And so there's they they may we're all hoping they're less likely uh, to lay off. But what in the current day are you kind of seeing that might give us an indication of of where we are in this? Um, economic kind of almost Goldilocks, especially as inflation is rolling over, right? People are getting real wage increases for the first time in over 20 years. But that was a long-winded, uh, more of a discussion than a question. But um, if you have any commentary about where you think we are, what you're seeing day-to-day in your research, uh, so you know we know this is uh, still going on. Can I take, I just want to go back to the U3 to 6, U6 distinction, and then Catherine, I'll let you answer the question that came at the end, because I love that you brought that up. Um, and I, 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 love, I love that that distinction is, is out there for your audience, because as you say, the U3 number is measuring, are you looking for work? Have, are you out of work and looking, looking for work? The U6 number, just to make sure that folks um, who aren't like super deep wonks and know exactly what we're talking about, folks know what it is. It includes people who are, say they're working part-time, but would like to be working more hours, for example. Um, it, it includes all of those folks, or if not all, many more of those folks who are kind of on the margins of the labor market, but don't want to be, um, that their employment circumstances aren't as fulsome as they'd like. And so I think, I mean, there are good reasons why we use U3 as the headline number, because there's all kinds of questions about motivation about reasons in in what goes on in the U6. So from a sort of, if you have to pick one number, I'm not saying that U6 is the right one. I think the U3 is. But to your point of thinking about what's a quantitative measure that might give us a little bit of a sense of some of the additional 
kind of job quality metrics um, that may or may not be kind of percolating or happening for folks, I think the U6 can be an interesting number to track. And so I will I will leave it at that because I want to give Catherine the opportunity to talk about what we saw actually happening through our qualitative work in terms of what's being captured outside of just just wages and employment. The very last thing I'll say before I do that um, is that there is a fascinating effort going on right now. Um, there's the Department of Labor is, is part of it. And I think the end game for all of this is figuring out how to better measure some of those job quality metrics in addition to wages. Um, but there's a fascinating larger effort going on right now to really figure out how do we quantify those things in a way that's really meaningful and include those in what we track and understand so that we can make sense of some of these questions about what's going on in the labor market. Because I think both recognize at this point, um, and in some ways I feel fortunate to be the generation that I am, because it's like, how did we not know this before? Like, of course we can collect data on this, but I recognize that that's like a total novelty because the idea that that's an easy thing to collect data on is like, it, I'm, it's, it didn't used to be, but now it's not easy. It's very difficult, but it is fully possible to actually have a much more multidimensional uh, measurement strategy for what a job looks like and therefore understanding the health of the labor market. And so some of this job quality stuff that we capture qualitatively, I think there's a future where that becomes quantitatively wrapped into what we're able to track so that we can get a better sense of what a tight labor market actually is and how it matters or it may not for workers going forward. So I will leave that kind of like statistical measurement high horse and hand it over to Catherine to tell you something about what we see happening in the real world. So I'll start with what I read just this morning at about like four o'clock in the morning, which was a fascinating article about the withdrawal of perks. So this is an article about how employers who used to try to attract workers with ping pong tables and free food and free dry cleaning um, are starting to withdraw those benefits. Um, and that's in the high flying, very well healed sectors, especially the tech sector that's uh, coming under a lot of pressure. And so I think they, ha they are feeling they have to show their shareholders that they're being a little bit tougher and so they're using these somewhat symbolic means, but they probably also cost them to some degree. Um, so there, is a, there are poignant stories about how workers used to line up at the food line and bring home their dinner, uh, and they're not able to do that anymore. Um, now, for the people that we're interested in, those kinds of benefits have never been available. But here's what became available to them that uh, really is revolutionary. And I say this as someone who years before wrote a book about low-wage workers, mostly based on field work in Harlem in New York. Um, those are fast food workers, and, and the book was called No Shame in My Game, The Working Poor in the Inner City. At the point that I wrote that book, where unemployment was very high and the ratio of job seekers to those who succeeded in getting one of those jobs was 13 to 1, there was nothing but low wage, I mean minimum wage, and, and it hadn't moved in a decade. There was no sick pay. There was no vacation pay. Um, there was a lot of pressure to leave the workplace if there weren't customers coming in the door, so hours would be shorted. And that put people into even more fragile circumstances. Well, today, the fight for 15, that's over. And workers won. $15 an hour, that's kind of the entry level. And Lots of companies that hire low wage workers like Walmart are, are you know, now at 15 to $24 an hour for entry level. But they're doing a lot more than that. There is now paid vacation, college tuition. As a provost of a university, I pay a lot of attention to that. McDonald's never offered college tuition to anybody before, but when they started to see the labor turnover grow, they began to offer college tuition, vacation, health benefits. I mean, the low wage labor market doesn't look anything like it did when I first started studying it. And I think it's an open question whether it will stay this way. Um, you know, the, the, there are some benefits that if retracted are so startling to people that I think employers would have to feel like they had a huge command over the labor force before they could do this. Um, and there are others that may be uh, on the margins and are more symbolic than they are financial. But fundamentally, the benefit structure has changed in dramatic ways for the better. 
And I think both Elizabeth and I would predict that that will help make those jobs into stepping stones to better careers. It will provide more stability. It provides more incentive. When employers are spending that kind of money, they have more incentive to train people to make them more productive because they need to recapture some of those costs. And so if that happens, and, and we did see that happen, we chronicle this in the book, when employers begin to bring in people that they're from sources they're not familiar with and who lack the credentials they're accustomed to, they have to provide the training that creates the human capital that makes those people valuable on the job. They, they don't have it coming in the front door, for example. And you know these sound like very trivial examples, but multiplied across the whole country, they really matter. Um, if you're hiring somebody in um, you know, the trash management business or recycling, and these are fundamentally blue collar jobs, they you know, have long required a strong back and a tolerance for a lot of dirt and, and heat, um, you would have been able to demand the special kind of uh, license you need to operate a truck. Coming in the front door, you wouldn't have even interviewed somebody who didn't have that kind of license. And you probably would have been able to demand some level of experience. But in the period in which we began this work, you couldn't find either. So what the employers did was create their own training programs. They enabled these new workers coming, you know, sometimes from leaving the prison door to coming into this job to uh, ride along with more experienced workers for a week or two to provide that kind of internal training. They paid for them to get that driver's license or that special truck license. Um, you know, this is modest levels of human capital, but that makes that person movable to some other trash company if they don't like the one they've been employed by. And that gives them power in the labor market, which forces employers to raise their wages to hold on to people. Now, when the, when the investment is modest in training, you know, maybe an employer will decide, okay, if I don't like Johnny and Johnny's bugging me for a higher salary, I'll just let Johnny go and pull in somebody else. But if you can't find that somebody else, you're going to respond to Johnny with some of those benefits of training and higher salaries that are make, will make Johnny a more stable human being and better able to support his family. But you will also provide him with the wherewithal of a track record. And track records really matter in the labor market, especially if you are entry level and low skill. If you can show an employer that you've worked successfully for, I don't know, six months in a job that they routinely would have seen a three month turnover, you are now a more valuable prospect in the labor market. So you start to see that people can jump ship to a better job or move up internally. And that upward movement internally will also um, necessitate more training and more skill. So multiply that times you know hundreds of millions of people and you're starting to talk about a labor market that's functioning for the low wage worker in ways that are very nearly unprecedented. Um, and I think in the long run, far, far better than any welfare system or state support we could provide, or even necessarily training outside the workforce. There is something to be said for firm specific uh, skills that people gain and can probably only gain when they're on the job in that way. So perks, benefits, training investment that create mobility opportunities and stabilize the lives and the workplaces uh, of the workers. Those are the changes that we saw, and I think they are nigh onto revolutionary in the most positive way. You, you perfectly teased the $64,000 question for me going through chapter one of the book, which is durability. And we'll, we'll jump to that in a second. But first, one more set of definitions. Because our country is so different, really, from every other country socially, the term low wage workers doesn't begin to capture the complexity of those folks. So can you talk a little bit about the terms, um, you know, who have, who have been, who get left behind or there's the, who have been stigmatized um, or underemployed uh, chronically and, and just talk about those different groups before we get into the question of durability. So let, let me take a crack at that and I'm going to turn to Elizabeth. Um, there are a number of groups that are, have traditionally been stigmatized and therefore put at the back end of the labor market. It doesn't mean they never find work. It means they might be the last hired. Um, and only when employers are sort of pushed do they end up successful. This would include especially young black men. This would include anybody who's had contact with the criminal justice system. Um, 
in some periods, this would include single mothers. It almost always includes people who are high school dropouts or who have very, you know, very modest education. And, you know, there's a lot of interesting research to show that the very same job, literally the same job in a tight labor market region will have much lower entry requirements than the, the same job in a loose labor market. So part of what we're seeing is that this kind of credentialism creep, if you will, you know, happens because employers can do that when they're facing a slack labor market and, and the workers they're considering don't have too many choices. They can now ratchet up the demands for what they're looking for at the entry level. And you might ask, why do they bother? And I think the answer is, even if you don't absolutely have to have a college degree for that job, if you can find someone with a college degree, they probably will be more productive. But when the opposite is the case, when you can't find anybody, all of a sudden, it turns out you didn't need that college degree. Instead, you need somebody who's willing to learn and you need the, the apparatus to enable them to learn. And once you do that, you discover all kinds of people actually are quite capable of doing these jobs. That durability question, which I know you're going to get to later, <clears throat> is also a question for how long that lasts. And I think that one of the things that motivated us to look especially at people coming out of the prison system is that they are the most notoriously hard to employ. They, they are really at the back of the pack um, and are restricted in many ways by law from even competing for jobs, for example, that involve any form of federal contract even if it's a construction job, no chance. But it turns out that when employers are really strapped, they will hire people who come out of the prison system. And our question in part was, how often do you have to do that? And for how long before you start thinking of people coming out of the prison system as a source you should be considering rather than John, he's an exception, he's, ex he's amazing. What a diamond in the rough but there might not be any other Johns out there. So, you know, when things start to go south in the labor market, I'm not gonna hire anybody else coming out of the prison system. And what we found was that as this tight labor market proceeds, employers start to form connections, especially with intermediaries that stream that labor force toward them. They do start to make a habit out of hiring people coming out of the prison system. So these are the durability questions that really matter because if this only happens when we're in a historically tight labor market and that's the only time, well, it's still good news, but it might not be persistent good news. Elizabeth, do you wanna pick up where I left off? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you covered things pretty well. So I'm gonna, I'm, rather than adding more words, I will turn it back to, to John. All right, let's jump into the durability question. And to clarify for the listener, what I think we're talking about is the, look, if unemployment goes from 8% to 4% and back to 8%, people lose their jobs. But some of the things maybe that I'm finally understanding would include benefits, perks, training as just like an, an expectation that these jobs would have those things, that if those things stick, that's a durable benefit. But speaking directly to the worker, having just experience on your resume that you didn't have before. And the prison system examples, uh, the most painful one, because that first job is clearly the most difficult uh, to get and sometimes impossible. I didn't know that about federal contracts, by the way, that was, that was interesting. So, um, but you explain in your words when you say, you know, there, because again, we have, we have business cycles. We went from 10% unemployment, the great financial crisis down to crazy low levels in 2018. COVID hits, we're back to 10%. We're down to three and a half percent. People are getting hired and fired uh, every day, even when the unemployment rate doesn't change. What do you see? Uh, and you're very honest in the book. Some, th some things are durable and other things... You, you're, it's tough to make the case. Um, so what stays, do you think, and I know this is, a, this is a historic market that we're in, and I'm suddenly becoming optimistic thinking about it as you explain it, like, ah, this might, this might, like this stuff might actually stick around. And be, for instance, the $15 wage, you know, or things like that. And you are, Catherine, in a different part of the world with the ping pong and the, you know, um, the, the yoga classes, 
um, for people who missed it, Catherine's in, in Northern California. Uh, but for the rest of the world, what, what stays historically? What do we lose historically? To just describe that, uh, the durability of the benefits kind of on a macro basis, and maybe that's Elizabeth's call. And then on the individual basis, like I got a job, I got training. Yes, I got laid off in the 2024 recession, but it's going to be much easier for me to get a job next time because of that, the benefits of the tight labor, mar- labor market. I'll let you guys go after it. Can I start on this one, Catherine? Yes, please do. Yeah. Um, so I think a couple of things. One, what we see that sticks, and this is more on an individual level than a macro level, but what we see that sticks is to the points that Catherine was making earlier. When you ha- get an opportunity to actually create a work history and create an earnings history that's more durable than what you've had in the past, right? Many of these people sort of let's set aside someone who's been incarcerated for years and comes out of prison um, and is actually able to get a job. There's populations worth of, of people here who've been in and out of the labor market in a weaker labor market who are part of the labor market, but they're like, they're the U6 folks maybe, right? They're the folks who are working part-time. Their their work is more transitory. If you the are underemployed, like, right? That's what exactly. they call it. Exactly, you're, right. you're underemployed in any number number of ways. In a tight labor market, if you're able to get a more standard work history, right? You've got full-time employment. Um, you've got a more standard full-time employment history. You've got full-time employ- employment uh, to kind of be be earning for a consistent period of time. Even if you lose your job, um, when the economy goes south, what goes up almost always must come down. Um, <laughs> so even if you you do lose your job, your ability to actually bounce back is that much stronger because you have this work history and because some of the kind of scarring effects that typically hit so hard for folks at the bottom, um, they're not gone. This is not to say that that a tight labor market just erases all the problems because it certainly doesn't. Um, but you have a very different, you look very different both on, on paper to an employer and I would argue to yourself in some ways in terms of work history and possibility than you would have in a kind of weaker tight labor market or in a weak labor market historically when you've just kind of been like apparently floundering. Um, so that gives you the prospect to bounce back more quickly or potentially not lose your job at all because you, you've kind of proven yourself that it's it's worth keeping you around even when things go softer. Um, so that's, that's kind of point one in terms of what might be durable. And then the other thing, and I think this is important um, and trying to, you know, I don't like to get into predictions, but kind of speculation or at least theorizing around what's happening now in particular is that I think there are a confluence of forces that potentially make now in the some ways very similar to what we've seen, right? We know that that first part of what happens, it could be durable coming out of tight labor markets. Um, we've seen that in the past, but there are a lot of things happening now, I think, that are the confluence of a social disruption that came out of COVID and has potentially changed both workers and employers' ideas of what work might look like um, and what we actually potentially need to do as a society to actually make work work, um, combined with Black Lives Matter and George Floyd's murder and all of the kind of racial awakening. Um, many people were already very much awake, but I think the rest of the country woke up and has been forced to stay awake in a much more real way that leave me quasi optimistic, I have to say about some more kind of structural durable changes that I think are possible now, even if the labor market goes south. And some of that is policy. um, But some of that is employer action and kind of a setting of, of precedent that suggests that, as Catherine said, it's hard to pull back benefits once they're offered. Um, but it's also potentially not just like hard to pull them back once they're offered, but even harder now because folks understand that it's, you know, the calculus of whether or not it's worth showing up at work, who deserves what has potentially changed just enough that there might be some durability. And one of the things that I'd like to see the arguments in this book do and the data in the book do is to actually convince people that even when the economics for an employer aren't perfectly aligned, right now the incentives are pretty strongly aligned for employers to do as much as possible for workers. That is not always the case, right? Like I understand and particularly, you know, it depends on the type of employer, but particularly a small business does not have a ton of flexibility when the labor market starts to contract because the margins are so tight. But there are ways of continuing to recognize that if you're going to offer a job to anyone, 
like this is part of what people are going to need to be willing to show up at work. Um, and that we've kind of changed our calculus there, which I think is hugely important because there are so many spillover, positive spillover effects to society um, and potentially long-term kind of cost reduction to actually having more folks attached to the labor market and attached to good jobs in the labor market. I'd like to add a couple of other points that I think do push in the direction of durability of this situation. Um, and they are things like, very low birth rates, which began, uh, you know, actually began around uh, 2000 and then got really sharply exacerbated by the Great Recession, where we saw fertility rates absolutely fall right off the cliff. And then they happened again during COVID. And what that means is that over time, we've had a shrinkage in our population, shrinkage in young people. Now, in higher education, we're seeing this in spades. They're, they're not in our classrooms. And there are K through 12 systems that are starting to contract because the babies just weren't there. And over time, they haven't been there for quite a while. So we have a low, le relatively low level of entrance into the labor market pool to begin with. Now add to that, for all kinds of reasons that we probably wouldn't agree with this trend in many ways, but we also slammed the door on immigration. When you slam the door on immigration, you also restrict the labor supply. Um, and so the combination of low domestic birth rates and very low immigration means that we've got a constrained labor pool. Now add to that something I think we don't really understand, but we can see in the data, which is men, especially somewhat older men, but still very much in the working age as, as we know it, leaving the labor force, just not there anymore. The great this, retirement. Right? Yeah, this does not seem to be what's happening to women. And maybe there's a, I, I think there's probably a connection there if we could look inside households that women are working longer and their partners and husbands are, are, are exiting the labor market faster than they used to. But you put those three things together and that strikes me as fairly durable unless suddenly we decided, which we don't seem politically to be interested in, opening the floodgates of, of immigration, which is historically how we've enlarged our labor force because birth rates are really hard to affect and they take many, many years to make a difference anyhow. So you look at these, these long-term dynamics and I think there's reason to believe that we're not going to see the kind of response to the Fed's raising interest rates that we saw before. The Fed has been raising interest rates in, tr in order to try and, you know, slow down uh, these, these, this good news in the unemployment world, and it hasn't worked. Right? We, we've had record increases in the pace of, of interest rates, and we're still, you know, unemployment continues to go down to 3.4%. This is why I think all of our friends in economics are going to have to start rewriting their 100%. Rules. 100%. Nobody really understands this, but some of these forces do say to me that it would take a really sharp, recession of the kind, you know, that the Great Recession, um, what represented before we'd see major, major movement. We're just not seeing much. Can I add one more big demographic trend, Catherine, that Please. you alluded to, but didn't, um, didn't call out specifically, and that's the aging of the workforce as well, right? We have low fertility rates, and we also have an aging workforce just based on cohort size, right? The baby boom is gigantic and is aging out of work. And while some folks are working longer, there's interesting dynamics there. Fundamentally, we have an aging workforce that at some point, the number of workers who are coming in, particularly if we have a steady state immigration policy the way that we have now, the number of workers who are coming in far, far, far outweighed by the number of workers who are, who are aging out, even in a world where some workers are working longer. Um, so the fundamental dynamics of kind of macro demographic trends are definitely weighted towards tight labor markets. And, you know, people often talk about this as a crisis, a skill shortage, a worker shortage because of the nature of demographics, um, which that's one lens. Um, but the other, and I think the one that we're putting out there is there is a massive opportunity to really upgrade on behalf of everyone um, in order to have a much more functional labor market that delivers not only economic growth, but also delivers benefits to workers up and down the ladder. Yeah, we, we've seen unprecedented supply-side shocks in so many different areas of the economy. You had the, the war in Ukraine, say oil prices go up. You wouldn't think the Fed would look at that and say, well, I should raise interest rates. There, that doesn't make any sense. We had an avian flu that wiped out 
30 million birds egg prices doubled. Should the Fed raise rates because of that? No, that'd be goofy. And I think what's missed is that the labor situation is yet another supply side shock. And it's instead, unfortunately, what worries me is, you know, Powell has basically said, you know, I'm Volcker, not Burns. And he's very obsessed with the employment cost index at the expense of, of everything else without appreciating, again, that he's, you know, banging his head against the wall and he's going to keep banging his head against the wall to the detriment of um, a lot of low wage workers. So I don't want to get too much into, let's get into um, um, the other $64,000 question policy chapter eight what do we do about it and you know there's a there's a big one up front i might I might leave to the end if we even get to it it's, it's just about what we're talking about balancing inflation with full employment and what the fed's charter is supposed to be about um you know soft landings only happened i think once in the u.s they've happened elsewhere more often that's a whole nother book right why how is our central bank functioning compared to uh, those around the world um but let's talk about one aspect of policy that I'm interested in. There's things that companies do, as you said, to retain employees. They create jobs, programs, tuition reimbursement. And it seems like uh, governments at all levels can do similar things and do. Are there things that are done better by one entity or the other that, that especially ironically, like, you know, the companies are doing this when markets are, go, are strong and really the opportunity is let's do them, let's do the training and the education things while markets are weak. So when things turn around, they have jobs. But talk about the difference between kind of the, the, the private market and the public market approach to uh, job training and improving skills and, and making people more valuable to employers down the road. So I'll take a first crack and then turn it over to Elizabeth. You know, I think this is a really critical question and it's one of the hardest ones to answer especially in a country that is obsessed with cliff effects and with um, free rider. You know, we shouldn't provide anything more than absolutely necessary to keep people alive, which I think is a, a misguided way of thinking about what the proper role of government is. I think of government as a stabilizer, as a, uh, a force that helps when, when things are really tight and, and rough, it is that sort of safety net. But when that's not the case, I'd like to see our benefit programs produce two things, stability and a springboard to mobility. Because when that springboard functions properly, and that means being a little bit more relaxed about those cliff effects, it could enable people to develop their own private safety nets, which in the end, I think is probably better. Not because I want to see government undo a fundamental substrate, because I think that's crucial in a capitalist economy. Things do fall apart, and it is not in anyone's interest to see high rates of poverty and you know cities falling apart and crime and all of the things that come with it. But we are so obsessed with the free rider problem that we cut people off very quickly before they can stabilize on their own. One of the examples we turn to in the policy side of the book is Section 8 housing vouchers. One of, you know, it, it is, has escaped no one's attention that one of the other things that heats up in a tight labor market is rent. Right? We, we start to see an ex- absolute explosion in rental costs as well as you know, homeowner costs, but the population we're thinking about is more concerned with rentals. So if we say to people that as your earnings grow or as the earnings in your household your children, your partners, as everybody in the household is working, they are able to pool money. If they could do that long enough so that they had their own cushion, they might be able to afford a, a home of their own and not need a Section 8 voucher anymore. But if we pull that Section 8 voucher too quickly, now we find people who are incredibly frustrated because whatever forward motion they've been able to make on their own is ripped away as they discover they can't afford rent in their neighborhood anymore. This doesn't make any sense. And we chronicle families in the book where the the parents are working, the kids are working, and all of a sudden they are approaching that Section 8 boundary and they say, oh my God, we're going to lose our housing. Kids, you better move somewhere else. Now you can't pool that income. Now everybody's spending more on rent because there's two households that have to be supported or more. This doesn't make any sense because the likelihood that it will push people down below the level of viability grows. 
how much better it would be if we just let them hold on to those bloody Section 8 vouchers a little longer until there's a greater margin between their earnings and their expenses. Because families can manage on their own way better than we can manage for them if they have those resources. But it takes, it's a higher threshold than our government programs tend to recognize, which is why I think thinking about programs like Section 8 as a springboard to a more middle-class standard of living is better than thinking of it as just a, just a pure safety net in, in times of crisis. So, you know, government can do things to lend stability that I think are hard for private employers to do. Private employers can do a lot to encourage and, and support mobility, meaning training, wages, um, and benefits, which, uh, you know, unfortunately in this country link things like healthcare to the workplace. Uh, personally, I think that was a huge mistake eons ago, but in, that is the system we're in. Stability of housing, healthcare, and you know, basic income are critical to the life chances of any low wage working family, and even more to the next generation, who if raised under conditions of stability, finish high school, go on to college, get better jobs, and that intergenerational poverty transmission belt stops. Isn't that really what we want? That's what we want. We don't want people to have to need these programs. We want them to be able to manage on their own. So I'm going to stop there and let Elizabeth weigh in. Um, I just want to pick up on the, um, the benefits question, because I think just to go back to the heart of your initial question, John, asking about kind of the public-private roles, I think benefits is a great example of a system that um, is totally influenced based on the tightness of the labor market in terms of the incentives for employers to offer it. But benefits also, many of the key benefits, and I'm talking about health insurance, I'm talking about paid leave, kind of economic stabilizer type benefits um, that are meant to insure against risks that are inevitable, right? I mean, it's insuring against a risk. You don't know when it's going to happen, but everyone is going to need health insurance at some point. Everyone, I would argue, at some point, if they had access to it, is going to need some kind of paid leave, whether it's because of the birth of a new baby or taking care of a serious health condition or taking care of um, an, an elderly um, or, or disabled younger family member. That's universal. Right now, if things are going well in the labor market, whose, whose job is sweetened by having access to those kind of benefits at work expands. And we saw that. We're seeing that right now. Um, but that's the kind of thing that everyone would benefit from actually having it consistently available, kind of regardless of what the labor market looks like. It shouldn't sit on the weight of, of a given employer. And it's completely irrational given the mobility that we want to see for workers, um, particularly low wage workers, right? You see the biggest job wage bump when you switch jobs, but that means potentially totally upending your benefit situation. So for a variety of reasons that would take a whole podcast, there are all kinds of reasons why, well, why our existing benefit system um, that lives with employers broader beyond just health insurance, I think is just like, it's a destabilizing force when it's meant to be a stabilizing force. So that's a place, just picking up on Catherine's point, where I think there's a relationship between employers, workers, and the government. And this is the classic kind of three-legged stool. It's how we've run social security since it existed, right? You have employers contribute, you have workers contribute, and you have the government then manage whether it's, you know, there are lots of different ways of designing it, but ultimately it is sort of, it's a social contract. It is on behalf of people, employers, and the economy as a whole that you have things like health insurance more universally accessible. You have things like paid leave away from work more universally accessible. And so that's the kind of thing that I think there are lessons in seeing how it expands at a private level and seeing how it benefits folks, that the long-term kind of durable version of that means actually just shifting kind of the institutional priors for how we do it and bringing the government in in a more fulsome way. And that's something that we've actually seen happening, right? And paid leave, um, I mean, I think we could start with healthcare. Our healthcare system is still obviously, um, again, five more podcasts on that one, but there is plenty to talk about in the ways that our healthcare system is not especially functional. Our health insurance markets are not especially functional, and yet they are fundamentally different than they were two decades ago, because we do have some version of a public beyond just Medicaid and Medicare. So for older people and very low income people and their kids, we have a different system that we're trying to 
and I say we again, that's um, to identifies myself with a, a certain political community, but are trying to actually expand because of what we see it does um, for the folks who've been left out, not just for their health, but also for their ability to work consistently and be more productive members of society if you're measuring productivity by whether or not you're working. It's the same thing for paid leave. We didn't used to have any public paid leave. We now have a variety of states that have a kind of social insurance model where everyone, if you're working, you pay a little bit in. This includes self-employed folks. So that's, again, a, a separate conversation. But just in thinking about the level of inclusion and what's possible, there are systems that come at very low cost on a day-to-day -day level in terms of the additional kind of contribution that folks need to make over time in order to participate, participate and have access to insurance against the risk of something happening in the future. But we know how to design programs like that, and we've seen them work quite effectively. So the question is, there's all kinds of questions of political will. We could be expanding that approach to policy in a variety of spaces that could fundamentally shift job quality, shift, shift standards of life, um, and take some pressure off of what employers are asked to do. Because we're asking a huge amount of employers on behalf of their workers right now. Um, and you know whether or not they're living up to that promise is, is a, long, a long conversation as well. But right now we're asking employers to do things that I don't think it makes a ton of sense for them to have to do. And it disadvantages certain kinds of employers as well. Small businesses, for example, it's incredibly difficult to figure out how to give workers benefits and compete with large employers who have entire HR departments for figuring this out. So we have a totally unlevel playing field, even when it comes to actually who as an employer gets to compete for good workers and where is innovation and growth going to come from if we're fundamentally kind of tipping the scale away from exactly the types of businesses that have typically driven innovation and growth for the economy. So there was a lot, a lot packed into that add on, um, but I will, I will leave it at that. No, that's okay. And <clears throat> I think that's a, a major problem in our society at both the government level and the, and the corporate leadership level is our inability to see past the next quarterly earnings or the next two year election cycle, you know, you talk, Catherine, about the stabilization role of government and specifically stabilization benefits in, say, Section 8 that are actually generational. And it's uh, not lost on me, the, the irony that I, I believe this benefits confusion that we have today, Elizabeth, I think was created, right, to get around uh, wage controls, right? There was price controls on wages. And so oh, we'll just start giving them benefits. And, um, and, we, and we now have what we have. I'll make uh, one other one other question on this front. I made a prediction during COVID that what I call UBI, I, th I think you might call it something different in the, in the book, Universal Basic Income, was here to stay. Uh, I'm, I'm wrong so far. But somewhere in the book, I think you mentioned that those folks actually have a higher employment rate. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because that's an example of like, even the creator of UBI, with, with again, ironically, Milton Friedman, talked about phasing it out in percentages, as you 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 get a you earn a dollar, you lose fifty cents, as opposed to dollar for dollar. But um, talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Yeah, I mean, so there are a number of pilots um, with UBI in cities around the country, and so we've really just recently started seeing empirical results to understand um, whether, you know, there are two competing hypotheses about what give, giving people a basic income, kind of unconditional cash over time. What is that going to do? On the one hand, you have folks touching on Catherine's point um, that argued that people are free riders. If you give them money, they're never going to work. This is just a handout forever. Why would we be doing that? It's going to drive down growth. It's going to turn America into like a country of sloths and everyone will be lying around and we'll just fritter away into nothing. On the other hand, you have folks, and I would put myself, and I think I can go so far as to say Catherine, in the, in the, in the bucket of folks who say, no, actually, if you look at both past evidence and also just think about humans, if you give people some basic stability, that creates something for them to build opportunity on top of for themselves. It allows them to invest in training. It allows them to actually go to work and be able to pay for childcare. It allows them to pay for healthy meals. It gives them just like, even if you've got all of that covered, it gives you the, the ability to just feel like you can take your kids out to the movies every once in a while. And that's just like part of living a well-lived, decent life. So these are two competing hypotheses about what UBI could do. And I don't think anyone really knew before these pilots what might actually be the case. There's, there's evidence um, largely in service of saying if you give people some economic security, mobility follows, um, but no one knew. And what we're seeing now with early results from the UBI pilots is that the folks, we were right, <laughs> just like boil it down, right? In terms of thinking about when you give people money, 
they earn more money, they go to work, they're able to actually fundamentally have, you know, all the things that I just said, economic security is a fundamental, necessary starting place for building mobility. And part of what you can do through UBI is that. That doesn't mean, I mean, I have all kinds of, of things that I could say about the politics of UBI um, and part of why, you know, you and I, John, I think could probably have a long debate about whether it, whether it's here to stay, should it be here to stay, how to think about it. But the fundamentals of just the idea of what happens when you give people money, um, and we know this from international work as well. I mean, there's actually a lot of a lot of work showing that if you give people money, it stabilizes their lives and gives them the opportunity to go out and be more productive members of society. And the way we typically measure that in the U.S. is do you go off and go to work and earn more? And the answer is yes. Um, so we could say more about the follow-on effects, but I'll let Catherine jump I'd in. I'd like to add to this, and then uh, actually I'm going to have to go to work pretty soon because it's this me is too. a work day for me. Yeah. Um, so I also want to say two things. First, people in the United States and in many other parts of the world, but especially in the United States, want to work. They have always been labor force addicts, <laughs> um, right down to the bottom of our society and to people who are not classified as working. So when I was doing my work on low wage workers in Harlem, one of the reasons they were able to go to work, especially if they had children, is that their, you know, their mothers who were officially on AFDC were working as childcare workers. Basically, they were taking care of the, their daughter's children to enable the daughter to be in the labor force they just weren't paid for it, or we could think of AFDC as a way of paying for childcare. And that is what was going on in those Harlem families. But fundamentally, Americans are workers. We value work, we measure ourselves by work right down to the very bottom of our society. There is no desire to be a free rider, or if there is, it's so minuscule that it's not so worth small. policy around. I, I, I once looked at the, the proportion of people who have never worked. And it's like below below one and a half percent have never worked. So why would we shape an entire social policy around this tiny, tiny category? Mostly what people need is the stability to go to work. And if they have a chance, they want to accrue assets because we're an asset crazy country, right? So if you give people enough money to pay for childcare, they will go out and get a job that allows them to make that much more money so that they can buy a car or a TV set or a better apartment because we are we fundamentally encourage this and it is as much a part of our ethos as it is our social policy. So I think we have to stop worrying about this phantom of people who don't want to work and recognize they are out there working um, because we we have incentivized it, because we believe in it, because it's it's a core part of our culture. And stop thinking constantly about this free rider problem, which I think has twisted our social policies in ways that are very, you know, are very debilitating to the whole country. What we need to do is foster and support a culture not only of work but of mobility. And in the end, if the government can help with stability. The private sector can help with mobility and the rest of us in the nonprofit world can help with skill acquisition. I mean, I don't want to say that employers can do everything. I do believe that education is, plays a crucial role in equipping people with, uh, you know, the, the skills and motivation they need to be successful in the labor market. But when all of those things work together, we have a more stable country. Elizabeth and I are working on a piece right now, like over this weekend, which is going to look at how, what happens to the, the um, safety net programs when labor markets are tight. And we know already from the initial research we've got in hand that we're gonna be writing up this weekend, that the, the demand for those programs goes down. And that's no great shock, but I'm, I don't think it's what the Fed chair is thinking about. When people are employed at high levels, the money we have to shell out for these safety net programs goes down because they don't need them as much. Isn't that really what we want in the long run? We want people to be able to stand on their own and we want that safety net to be there for them when the economy falls apart. That's the stabilizing function. But when it's growing and there's opportunity, we want them to be able to move up and ensure themselves that's what happens to a much greater degree when labor markets are tight. And that's why from, from our perspective, this is almost magical, except it's not magical, it's very logical. 
that when, you know, when workers have more clout in the labor market and can exercise it in, in accessing work they didn't have before or moving up or moving between employers to benefit themselves, they will do exactly that. And that's not really a social policy. That's the dynamic of the labor market itself. What social policy does is ensure those periods in between. And they, they will happen, although they don't appear to be happening right now, but they certainly have in the past. Um, and this is not the only time when we've seen tight labor markets either. But I think we can, if we had more time, we could go into the periods in which those tight labor markets had very durable effects. I think we're in one of those now, but it'll take time before we have the data to make that in a, a hard claim. But we know in the 1990s, that is what happened. Those tight labor markets had durable effects throughout the next business cycle. So there are periods when this has worked like an elixir and other periods where it's been too transitory. But at least at the moment, I think we have the opportunity not only to see the most beneficial effects of tight labor markets, but to think more critically about what it would take to maintain them while we let the Fed worry about inflation, which we know does matter. We are not dismissing this. It's more consequential for low wage workers than anyone else when the price of food goes up. You know, that's catastrophic for people at the low end. But we need to ask, is it their rising wages that's causing that to happen? I don't think so. No. And so I'm going to let you. Problems, energy costs, yeah. outsized profits from companies that are taking advantage of this cycle. You know, that's at least as important, if not more, than the lever that, that the Fed appears to be pulling. I'm, I'm going to let you both get to your day jobs, even though Elizabeth teased my second hour, which is this where innovation happens at the lowest levels of government cities and and, and um, private public partnerships. But until then, Catherine Newman, Elizabeth Jacobs, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. This was so much fun.